is the signs or the miracles that happened in the book of Acts. And um, therefore, you know, you kind of you know, operate within the principles of what you've been taught. You've been taught by the pioneers, other brethren have uh, come in the like spirit and taught you certain things. Um, and a question that's, if this is any help to anyone, the question that's often asked is, um, especially from younger brethren, is what are you looking for in the scriptures? What are you looking for um, when you're studying the scripture? And this gives us a good example. You have it on the screen in front of you, and we really don't even need to go through the screen quotations in detail. It's the nucleus of the gospel is the things of the kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ. It's all the scripture is about those two doctrines, the elements of the kingdom, and of course, the covering of sin, the atonement through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that's what it's all about. And what happens is, rightly so, we put a very strong emphasis on the doctrine for people learning the truth. Um, our young people that have even come up through our Sunday schools and even the world without, we put a very strong emphasis on the doctrine of the kingdom, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. The law was a shadow leading to Christ. So therefore, when we come to Christ, there's the covering for sin. And then after baptism, sometimes it's the inclination of brethren to start reading through the scriptures and looking for a little exhortational or and little is that sounds a little a bit be meaning. And I, I, I don't mean it to come across that way. Merely is probably a better word. They're merely looking for exhortational points or uh, moral lessons. And certainly the parables teach us that there is a moral, moral infrastructure. The law teaches this to everything. But what we learn here is, as noted in our brother's opening prayer, Christ is the express image of Yahweh himself, the deity. And you have in Hebrews chapter one, he's greater than the prophets, he's greater than the angels, chapter three is greater than Moses, chapter four is greater than Joshua, and so on and so forth. Here in chapter six, the Abrahamic covenant, in chapter seven, Melchizedek, he's the greater than the high priest, he's than all the sacrifices, the tabernacle, and he tells us how to move on from the first principles of the oracles, which is really a reference to the law, and just simply reference that word oracles, and you'll find that it's a reference to the law, so he's telling us how to move from milk to meat. And it is not merely to look at the moral or the exhortational points. Those come very naturally from the word of God. It's to stick with the doctrine. And he says that in chapter 6 and verse 1. <clears throat> we take these doctrines and we now move on to the meat application of the doctrines. And that's where I think as a brotherhood, we have come, become a little softer in our exposition because the primary focus of our exposition is more moral or it's exhortational, which is certainly is a part of the word, more than it is doctrinal. There is no way, obviously, all the prophetic signs in Daniel and the apocalypse, that is not talking about mere moral things. By the way, there's no one, no possible way to understand Bible prophecy without the Old Testament prophetic scriptures. So, that's my answer to that question. I just recently was asked this question. What is it that you're looking for? So God willing, as you saw in the first class on the signs of Acts, where you're dealing with um, the healing of the lame man taken into the temple, which is the great statement of the Lord Jesus Christ, destroy this temple, he built another one that's about the principle of God manifestation in men. Now they're going, God is going to walk in them and dwell in them. So a lame man he is cured in the name of Jesus Christ and brought into the temple. So it's the principle of God manifestation. So um, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these doctrines and how they are lifted up. And we talked about last week that the book of Acts is divided into two primary parts, which is, again, doctrinally is how we understand the scriptures. Absolutely, we understand that. To the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That's how Acts is laid out. The first part of Acts is about Peter, as Galatians 2, 7 tells you. He is the apostle to the circumcision, the Jew, where Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles or uncircumcision. And of course, the scriptures say that. So Acts is laid out after that fashion. But you notice the bottom quote here in Luke 11, verse 30, and then it says, 
remember, and this is the other thing, is that a faithless, adulterous generation was seeking a sign. And he said, no sign will be given unto you except for the sign of Jonah the prophet, who was a sign to the Gentiles. So the Son of Man will be to this generation, this evil viper of gener generation of vipers, adulterous generation of the Jews, the 42nd generation that were rebellious and would not hear his word. Now, it's important because remember this. When we're dealing with the book of Acts, I think we're going to find something just lovely today um, when we're dealing with the layout, the chronology in the book of Acts. So the book of Acts is spirit directed. And this is simply coming from simple quotations. The spirit said to Philip, go near and join to the chariot where Ethiop the Ethiopian eunuch was. Then the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. The spirit made me to go, bade me to go with him. It says in Acts 11, they ministered unto the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said through the prophet, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. I've called them and therefore sent forth by the Holy Spirit. Then Paul says, we would have gone to Phrygia. This is Acts 16 in the region of Galatia. But we were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia there. We tried to go to Bithynia and the Spirit suffered them not. So this is very much Spirit directed. Okay. And we understand the Spirit is the word fundamental principle we picked up in our first class. It's the power of God and it's a spoken word. So when we're looking at the layout in the book of Acts, I think we're looking at something that is spirit directed, which is why you have that chronology. Now, that's important when we get to what goes on here in this section, because when we get to Acts chapter six, we're dealing with Stephen. And it, again, as our brother said in our prayer, here was the Lord Jesus Christ, who was in the express image of Christ. And then all the disciples thereafter, we read from the epistles, were to be conformed, you and I, are to be conformed to the image of Christ who was, again, as our brother said, a full manifestation of Yahweh in the flesh. So it's all about the principle of God manifestation. Well, here is Stephen. He is a man, and you can clearly see the pattern here, who is in the image of Christ. He was full of faith in the Holy Spirit and therefore full of faith and power and doing great wonders and miracles. And we covered that in the first class. The one is based upon the other. If you have faith, you will say into this mountain, be removed. So the understanding of the truth equates to great wonders and miracles. That's why Christ said, is it expedient that I go to the Father? You'll do greater miracles and works than I did. Because your understanding will be complete. The comforter now, the resurrection will be the key to bring you into full understanding. And the Jews who resisted him were not able to resist his wisdom and his spirit. They said we heard him speak blasphemous things against Moses and against God. They stirred up the elders and the people. They brought to him a council. They set up false witnesses. All of this is in red. You can see this is an exact pattern of Christ. They said we've heard him speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And remember, the daily sacrifice, AD 70, was taken away. It was the holy place. It was the Mosaic law that was removed. It was rolled up and taken out of the way. We've heard him say this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. Still, they will not let go of this statement that was addressed in the first sign and that he will change the customs that Moses delivered unto us. Again, we're still in this principle of how Christ the taking away the daily sacrifice, which the Romans did with their army, says the parable. And he said that to the Jews. That was stated to the Jews that the Gentile Roman armies would take away the daily sacrifice. And then now the word is going unto the Gentiles. He's going to change the custom of Moses. This holy place will be taken away. So here's a man conformed to the image of his master. And you'll see it in this simple chart. Let's not go through it for time's sake. It's a simple chart. The notes will be sent to you. You can see the corresponding verses between Stephen and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in the pattern of Messiah. Now, that's important because remember, <clears throat> as Christ said, the sign of Jonah the prophet. Well, that happened three days and three nights. Out in the sea, the waters of the nation into the belly of a fish, 
then vomited out into the land of the Gentiles. Okay? Here's what Acts 26 says. He was assigned to the Ninevites. The evil adulterous generation that sought a sign is the one that sought it, and it's not to them he went. Acts 26 says he would first suffer, he would be the first to rise from the dead, then show light to the people and to the Gentiles. So look what happens now after this pattern of Acts 6 and 7 with Stephen, okay? His name means a crown, and he represents the smiting of the shepherd and the Gentiles in light. His actual name means victory through suffering. It's used in the context of eternal life and the reward of eternal life. The crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of gold that shall never be taken away. Well, this leads us to the Apostle Paul. Because remember, if you go through his life, and of course he's condemning the Jews, saying what you did to Christ is no different than what you did to the prophets. The history, your entire history, is rejecting the servants and the messengers that Yahweh sent unto you. <clears throat> like the Lord, when he's taken outside the city and he's stoned, the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, whom we know, later known by Paul, a Gentile name. The coats is they defile their garments. It's the rejecting of the covering of Christ. And so that the representation of the element and the image of his death being the forgiveness of sins, he kneels down, says, lay not this into their charge, and he falls asleep. And of course, that's a figure of what the purpose of the atonement was. Because the exposition of the apostle says that. You in ignorance, you crucified the prince of life. Now repent. Save yourself from this untoward generation, this evil generation of vipers. So this is what happens at the smiting of this man who's conformed to the image of Christ. Saul is consenting unto his death. And at that time, there's great persecution in the ecclesia, which is at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They stayed in the area with the strongest persecution. Here is their scattering abroad. That is what happened with the death of Stephen and the persecution of Saul, the scattering of the Jews abroad. Okay, I think that's very important. As Peter himself confessed, there was a prejudice against teaching the Gentiles, and we'll see that. They go to the Jews only. And it's the interference of Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ, now power put into his hand, that takes the spreading of the Jews to spread the gospel outside of Jerusalem. Remember why it went into these foreign lands. It went into these foreign lands because of persecution. So that when we're having difficulty in our personal lives, brothers and sisters, remember, as we said before, quoting a sister very close to me, it's not about us. The truth is not about us. When difficulty comes in our life, look to the greater end. What was the fruit that came from that? Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, they fulfill a very important purpose, brothers and sisters, because the scattering of the Jews, literally, and their dispersion among the nations, literally, took the doctrine of the spirit of the Hebrew kingdom into the land of the Gentiles. By the way, Paul says the converse of that in Romans 11. When we see their regathering, know that the closing of the Gentile times is near which we've been looking at for quite some period of time. So devout men, those identified with the death and sacrifice of Christ, in the image of Stephen, of course, carry him to his burial, and Saul is making havoc of the ecclesia and committing men and women to prison. And look what happens. 
They're scattered abroad everywhere, and they go preaching the word of God. Now, this word scattered is very important. That phrase scattered abroad means to sow the seed. It literally means that. Now, we're told in Acts 11, verse 19, they went to the Jews only. That is going to change. This word scattered is literally translated elsewhere where to sow the seed. And remember, Christ in his parable says, now the seed, it's not the word. It's the word of the kingdom. It's the gospel in its corresponding account. The seed is the word of the kingdom. The kingdom, which remember what we said in our opening remarks, is the Hebrew kingdom. It's about the kingdom of Israel restored. So that when someone has finished baptism and they go on to meet, don't just look at the exhortational points of Scripture. Go to the deeper things of doctrine, which, of course, Hebrews goes into. So, again, the movement of these literal Jews, which constitute the nucleus of the kingdom, help us Israel, is directly connected with the hope of Israel that goes into the Gentiles. They were scattered abroad. They are the seed of Abraham. And that's in the red context, brothers and sisters, of our bullet points here. That is literally the same word. The seed of Abraham after the flesh is sown among the nations. We always said that, I will sift you among the nations. They're addressed in James and 1 Peter as the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Therefore, in their res restoration, it says that they will be planted again in the land. So there are these horticultural terms. I think that's the right word. There are these horticultural terms implemented for the seed of the Jew in the planting of the land, the fig tree, the olive, so on and so forth. Okay. So now Paul, who has chased this by his persecution, is a representative man for the hope of Israel. Now, we know that people in the Bible, this was in our first series on the introduction of how to reason out of the scriptures. Moses representing the law, Sarah, Hagar, and their sons, uh, allegories, so on and so forth. Paul says that he represents the remnant of the Jews. That's very important. He's the remnant seed of the Jews to enlighten the Gentiles. And that's a very important, brothers and sisters, by the way that it is Peter and Paul, Jews, who enlighten the Gentile. So we never lose context that even though we're Gentiles, the nucleus of the gospel is Israelitish. Remember how strongly we emphasize that in our first principles. Don't let go of that. When we move on to the meat, remember, we never let go of that principle. Elders in the truth that are very close to me have always said the truth is about Israel. It has never been about anything different. And Paul says, using himself as an example. Okay, so here you have the nucleus of it in Romans 9 through 11 is the special exposition Romans 9 through 11 of Israel and the Gentiles being grafted into it. How do you make sense of that? So he says, once you go through this in Romans 10, are we, are we suggesting that God has cast away his people? He says, far be it. That is not what I'm saying. I am an example of this. I'm an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, the tribe of the son of the right hand, Benjamin. I'm the example that God has not cast off his, off his people. Yet he's speaking to Romans, which he says is predominantly Gentiles in that epistle. So he represents this Jewish hope. He emphasizes multiple times that he was born and raised a Jew fully committed to the law. Okay. He says that he was a pattern, it's the word to type, of forgiveness extended in, that in me first should be shown the pattern of forgiveness unto all saints, first to the Jew, then to the Gentiles. Like the prophets, he was a representative man. We'll go into this more in detail. He was consenting and endorsing Stephen's death. And he kept the raiment of those that stoned them. He is the foremost persecutor of the Ecclesia, which, by the way, 
had the, and it's, this is the way with the system of the world and the people of the flesh. They never understand that they themselves are tools for God. It resulted in the very thing he looked to extinguish. He just scattered the gospel unto other lands. He was trying to contain it and drag people bound back to Jerusalem, and it did the exact opposite of that. It spread the gospel into further lands. Therefore, leaving that area, he becomes the foremost builder of the Ecclesia to the Gentiles. So here is Paul's conversion. By the way, remember this. Just be thinking ahead here. Because I believe that this is, and we can pick this up in conversation afterwards, I believe this is just tremendous. Because I always believe the chronology of the Bible is true. Remember, Acts 1 through 12 is about Peter, the apostle to the Jews, and the second part, chapters 13 through the end, are about Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. But here we are in Acts 9. Before we're done with Peter, talking about the conversion of Paul. Just keep that in the back of your mind. So he's seeking to slaughter the disciples of the Lord, and he goes to the high priest to get letters of endorsement to go to Damascus to synagogues there so that he can bring men bound, and it is that phrase used in the New Testament, bound and under bondage of the law to bring them back into Jerusalem. This is the high priest under the Mosaic ordinance. Christ himself, we looked at last week, is now exalted into the heavens as the high priest in a different status. And remember, when they healed the lame man, they brought them before the high priest and all the family of the high priest. And they said, by what name do you do these things? There was a changing of the priesthood, the daily sacrifice, the temple was taken away, the literal physical ordinances of the Mosaic were taken away, and so were its standards. In Jerusalem, very bottom of your screen, says Paul in Galatians 4, is figurative, the Jerusalem that now is, is representative of Hagar, who was taken from Egypt, who was a bond made from Egypt, representing the law, and is in bondage with her children. That's what he said the allegory represents. So the Jerusalem route, now he's trying to bring people back to the law in its figurative and literal sense. Okay, look what happens. So as he journeys, he comes to Damascus, not Jerusalem. He's, not in Jerusalem. he's looking to bring them back to Jerusalem. And there shines round about him a light from heaven. And he falls to the earth and hears a voice but he doesn't see anyone. And the voice says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The exhortational point, of course, you've done it under the least of these, you've done it under me. Who's persecuting Christ's ecclesia, the body of his headship, the bride of himself. The light from heaven is used to represent the light of the knowledge of Christ in the face of Christ as opposed to the mosaic. We'll get to that in just a moment in 2 Corinthians. It is divine light. And he falls to the earth, which is the exact same Greek word used in the same context of Romans 11, where he refers to himself as the preserved remnant seed. The fall of them will bring salvation to the Gentiles. And he hears Christ's voice from heaven. We'll get to this in a moment. The Mosaic law was from the earth. If we believe that law that was from the earth, says Paul in Hebrews, how much that law that was from heaven of Christ. And he's in Damascus, the place where Naaman, the Gentile, came to be baptized for the hope of Israel. And remember last week, our conversation afterwards, Christ said no prophet is accepted in his own country. There were a lot of lepers in Israel, 
but it was Naaman the leper from Syria, Damascus, that was cleansed in the river Jordan, accepting the principles of baptism in Christ. So many people experience in the scriptures we talked about before also in a class of figurative death and resurrection. So here is the case of Paul. It happened about noon, about midnight, about midday. It's the brightest part of the day, but yet the glory was brighter than the sun, he says in Acts 26. And he could not see because of the glory of that light. It is not natural light. It is divine light that is so much stronger than the sun, he couldn't see it. Just like Moses could not enter the tabernacle because of the Shekinah glory, the divine light. It's the brightness of Christ that is above the fading glory of the law. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians 3. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration, says the ministration of death, and we know why it was, because it exposed sin and therefore death. If that written and engraven in stones was glorious, and it was, it was holy, just, and good. And the children of Israel couldn't look steadfastly to behold the, behold the face of Moses. He had to cover it with a veil, the glory of his countenance that was going to be done away with. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministration of condemnation, which he just called the ministration of death, is glorious, how much more? The ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. And all three accounts where he references this here, where it's a literal account, on the times that he repeats it, he says that he saw no man. Because the doctrine, as we talked about before, of the full understanding of Christ, of the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, brothers and sisters, was realized at Christ's glorification. But when he was glorified, they knew all these things. That's when the real light of the truth was shown, is when he was glorified, when he was no more visible, taken out of the way. And so he says, who art thou, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus who not persecuted. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now that word pricks, is the same word in 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. He had a hard time letting go of the law. Trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? He said, arise, go into the city. It will be told thee what thou must do. And it says this in Acts 26. This was the revelation that came to him. I've appeared unto thee for this purpose. To make thee a minister and a witness both of the things that thou hast seen and the things which shall appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes Look what happens with Paul to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. Paul from the power of sin, Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, which is not available under the law for the inheritance among them that are sanctified. So this is the principle brothers and sisters we're talking about in this man. The Apostle Paul. And by the way, this revelation of the mystery that was given unto Paul, and we talked about this before in our introduction classes, we'll just quote the red in this quotation scriptures here. He says, the revelation of the mystery that was known unto him, that was not known in past ages in Ephesians 3, is now revealed that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs partakers of the promise of Christ by the same gospel of whom I'm now made a minister. Colossians 1, whereof now I'm made a minister. 
for the dispensation of God, which is given unto me to fulfill the word. That is the mystery that was hidden in past ages, but is now manifested. What is it? To make known the riches of his glory to the mystery of the Gentiles. Romans 16. According to my gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery, again, which was kept secret from the world began, which is, that's why there's this divine intervention with Paul, but is now made manifest by the scriptures and the prophets. It was there all the time. We'll see that in just a moment. It was made manifest, but it was known in the scriptures of the prophets. We're going to notice who comes to enlighten him and open his eyes. It's a prophet. To make known of you all nations, the obedience of faith. So that was the great mystery unraveled. Uncle John Thomas talks about this in Elpis Israel. You'll find all of these references. So he rises from the earth, the mosaic. There's a quotation in Hebrews 12 I talked about. And when his eyes were open, he didn't see any man, but desired that one would take him by the hand and lead him to Damascus, not Jerusalem. Remember, the opening of the eyes is the understanding of Christ in the law, prophets, and psalms. That's our Luke 24 reference we've referenced many times. And when he took bread and he blessed it, showing that he was a fulfillment of all the law, prophets, and psalms, their eyes were open, and he vanished out of their sight, just like Paul. He saw no man. He's gone. Their eyes are open to the understanding after his physical presence is gone, his glorification. So he arises from the earth, and he seeks one to lead him by the hands. That By the hand, that is the same reference to how Israel was taken under the Mosaic and led by the glorious arm of Moses. It's a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, and he's there three days without sight, either eating or drinking. Of course, he's identifying with Christ, but also Hosea the prophet says the nation of Israel. Two days, he's going to tear us, but then he will heal us and bind us up, and the third day he'll raise us up and ride, and we will uh, uh, live in his sight. So, he represents the nation and also the identification with Christ. It was necessary for his blindness to enlighten the Jew. In the word arise, he arose. It means to be spiritually enlightened. Not the resurrection, literally, but that which is a spiritual awakening. And so, here's this prophet, Hananiah, which means mercy and grace of Yahweh whose name appears five times in this record, who is told by the Lord to go unto Paul to open his eyes. Because Saul has to see Christ in the law and prophets. Again, as our brother quoted in his opening prayer, the law was given by Moses, and it was glorious. There was a form of truth and a shadow in it. But grace... And truth, the fulfillment of the law, came by Jesus Christ. And Paul again says, I obtain mercy to show myself a pattern. And by the way, and this is a doctrinal point, our quotation read at the bottom of your screen from Romans 4. The term the law is referring to the Jews under the Mosaic. The term grace is referring to to all of Israel under the Abrahamic covenant. For the promise that Abraham would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Faith and grace are the Abrahamic covenant to all the seed. Through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, the promise of none effect, because the law worketh wrath, manifested sin. Therefore it's faith that it might be by grace 
for the end purpose of the promise that all the seed, grace is all the seed, not to only those that are of the law, but to those that are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, the father of many nations. Grace is a system of things that represent Abraham as the father to all nations. And that's what Paul, Saul here, had to learn. Not just those under the law. Not just those under the law. So Paul needed to see Christ as a fulfillment of this principle. Brethren, I have written to you more boldly as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given unto me that I should be a minister of Jesus Christ unto the Gentiles so that the offering up of the Gentiles would be acceptable. Here's that period of grace. It's the dispensation of grace, Ephesians 3 here, the quote. It's the dispensation of grace that is given unto him that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs. It's the gift of grace that God has given unto him that he would preach among the Gentiles. There is the law that refers to the natural seed of the Jews and the dispensation of grace, which is all the seed, including the Gentiles. <clears throat> so Ananias said, I've heard that he's done many evil things under the saints of Jerusalem. But the Lord said, he's a chosen vessel to bear my name, notice the order, to the Gentiles, kings, and then ultimately the restoration of Israel. He's a chosen vessel. And we know that saints represent that, a chosen vessel. He was very much that for, he says, the election of grace. Bottom quote in Romans 11. For the election of grace. It's a system of things for all the seed of Abraham. And I didn't know this, by the way, until I did the study in, um, in Acts, started looking it up from some things that Brother Thomas said, that grace is actually a system of things for all the seed of Abraham under the dispensation given now unto the Gentiles. So this is what we read very quickly in Isaiah 49. It's quoted again in Isaiah 42. Speaking of Christ, that he formed Christ from the womb to be a servant, to show light unto the Gentiles. And here's the important things, brothers and sisters, involved in this. And we're going to talk about this in Peter, God willing, in the next class. This is why he's a chosen vessel. But it wasn't Christ personally who was the light to the Gentiles. Now, now careful before you, you shirk at that language. Going, what do you mean Christ wasn't the light to the Gentiles? I'm saying personally. He died, and he was assigned to the Ninevites, and he was a light to the Gentiles, but not personally. He was in heaven. His death and resurrection showed light to the Gentiles, but it was carried out in his apostles, namely Paul, but also Peter, and God willing, we'll look at that next time. And that's why he says it please God to separate me from my mother's womb. Look what it says in Isaiah 49. He formed me from the womb to be a servant. And Paul says, by the way, as one born out of time. He was born for a different time. Isn't that interesting? Has called me by his grace to reveal his son in me to preach among the ethnos, the ethnic, the Gentiles. So that's the importance of this, brothers and sisters. And that gets us into this, why I believe Paul is inserted into the record in this place. I think there's a reason why he's inserted in this place. And again, I learned this through my studies in Acts, um, just circumstantially. So we talked about the first half of the book of Acts is about the Jews and then the Gentiles. But before Peter passes off the scene, here we have the interjection of what's going on in Romans 9 about the conversion of Paul, which, by the way, Acts 10 and 11 are about the conversion of Peter, who enlightens the first Gentile, Cornelius. Interesting. 
So inserted in this interruption of the record of between the Jew and the Gentile period, you have the death of Stephen, the smite of the shepherd, the crown, in the form and image of his Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, lay not the sin to the charge, forgive him, Father, falls asleep. And you have Paul and the conversion of Paul interjected into this. Why? Remember, we're in this dispensation of time called the dispensation of grace. So that the promises to Abraham are to all the seed, not just the law. His purpose was to bind men and women and to bring them back into Jerusalem, which was in bondage with their children that now is. It's Jerusalem under the law. Instead, it's this dispensation of grace to the Gentiles. I found this in the expositor, in the Romans expositor put out by Lois. And all those series are just wonderful for Bible knowledge. Just wonderful. And we're going to find that in the succession of the quote of the law, prophets, and psalms. This was amazing when I saw this. To me, you may have known it was there. The law, prophets, and psalms, it is, was always predicted that the Gentiles would glorify God. In fact, Solomon says that when he finishes the temple. He prays that all the earth should come and worship at this temple. He knew it was for that. Jesus Christ was made a minister of circumcision to confirm the promises made to the Father. And that's an interesting statement. We know what the promises to the fathers is. We know what it refers to. That the Gentiles might glorify God. And then he quotes. As it is written, I will confess thee among the Gentiles. And again, he quotes another reference. Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Deuteronomy. And again, he quotes another reference, which teaches us why you have to piece the word of God together. Praise the Lord, Yahweh, all ye Gentiles, exalt him, all ye people. It's a quote from the Psalms. And again, verse 12, Isaiah saith, he quotes the prophet. There shall be a road out of Jesse, he shall rise and reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall trust. This is the law, prophets, and Psalms, verse 8, proving that there was a confirmation of the covenants and the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that were always taught by the law prophets and souls. Paul had to see that. He didn't need to go back to Jerusalem to take people bound. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was an expert in the law. He needed Hananiah the grace and mercy of Yahweh to come enlighten him. I will show him the great things that he will suffer for my name's sake. And you know, he says that brothers and sisters, not just the shipwreck being beaten and stoned. He says literally that he manifested Christ in himself. Look at these quotations in Galatians six. I bear in my body, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Bearing about the body and the dying of the Lord, that his life would also be manifested in our body. Colossians 1, in my sufferings, I fill up that which is left. In, well, that's amazing. That which is left behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. He was filling them up. For his body's sake, the ecclesia, he was an extension of the Lord Jesus Christ's work. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ living in me. He was a manifestation, brothers and sisters, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Ananias went his way. He entered into the house, the ecclesia. <clears throat> he put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, you know, the one you persecute, that appeared unto the end of the way 
has sent me that thou would receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's spiritual enlightenment. He put hands on him. He was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ, Ananiah, the law and prophets, to not open his eyes. Remember what Luke 24 says. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't perform a miracle. He expounded unto them all things concerning the law, prophets, and psalms. He broke bread in their sight, and their eyes were enlightened, and they knew him. They, uh, they understood it. And he vanished out of their sight. What he needed was understanding. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh a sign. And that's why I say often to brethren, don't overemphasize and try to make signs, political signs, out of everything that goes on with world events. It's understanding of a doctrine that's the most important thing that will lead you to understanding of prophetic events. Immediately fell from his eyes, now having been enlightened by Hananiah, seeing the grace, the dispensation of grace of the Abrahamic covenant in the law, prophets, and Psalms, he arises and he's baptized. And this, by the way, his eyes is the same, opening the eyes of the Gentiles. And he received meat. What did our presiding brother start with? He's an expert in the law, brothers and sisters. He's an expert. And straightway, he goes into the synagogue, the place where the law is taught. And he preaches that Christ is the son of God, verse 20. He receives meat. The meat is understanding Christ and the law and the prophets. And Psalms, which is, of course, we've quoted before what Brother Thomas says in Phanerosis. The blindness is now gone from him as the one born out of time. He receives sight, he arises a new man is baptized, and he receives strength from the meat. And the meat is an advancement of the law, which is the milk. See John Martin's notes on Hebrews where he tells you that the oracles is referring to the law of Moses. Simple. So it's this simple, brothers and sisters. And this is the, the principal understanding I would suggest to everyone. And I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, Brother Howard Phillips told me, as well as some other brethren in our home ecclesia in Houston, when I first came to a, a knowledge of the truth and I was baptized, they all told me, study the law and the prophets. Because when you pick up the life of Christ and the epistles, you'll have no idea really what they're talking about. Paul was an expert in the law. And he says when he was enlightened, he immediately didn't confer with flesh and blood. He didn't go to Jerusalem to those that were apostles. He went into Arabia where the law was given and returned to Damascus. After three years, he went to Jerusalem. That tells us the need for depth of understanding of the law and prophets before we become teachers of it. Isn't that significant? Get your knowledge there, and then the things of the New Testament will come to light. Oh, I thought I understood the English of that, but what that is really stating and where it came out of the principle of the law and the prophets, far greater than what I thought it said. So he increased more in the strength. And that, of course, brothers and sisters, is the whole point of proving Christ from the law and prophets. Here's what Brother Robert says in the law of Moses. He says the second aspect, and you can get this, find this in the quotation. I forget what page number it's on. Sorry about that. Is plainly affirmed in the statement, the law was a shadow of the good things to come. There was a form of knowledge and truth in the law. Christ was the substance of the law shadows. And further, it promulgated the righteousness of God by faith. That it was witnessed by the law. Romans 3 and 21. This view of the matter enables us to understand how Christ could say he'd come to fulfill the law and prophets and that heaven and earth will pass. And they won't pass to one jot and tittle in no wise is fulfilled of all the law and the prophets. Robert Roberts from the law of Moses, because that's how he said I came to fulfill it. 
I was a fulfillment of all that. You'll get that section in the Law of Moses by Brother Roberts. Um, the teaching of Yahweh's Savior was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Let's just move past this because the quotations of Red just said it was always, that purpose was always known, but it was manifested in these last times. It has now been made manifest. It was now manifest in these last days for you. So let's just uh, sat, be satisfied with that. So now we're going to move to these uh, in reference for time's sake. I'm sorry. Look at let me look at the, the clock here. Yes, we need to conclude. Let me you, these notes will be available for you. How he goes through and he heals in the quarters that is Peter. Saul doesn't appear again till Acts chapter 11. It immediately moves over to Peter after the conversion of Paul. We'll talk about why that is. So there's um, a man, a certain man, that is kept his bed for eight years sick of the palsy. I do think that corresponds with the circumcision under the Abrahamic covenant. Let's move past that for time's sake and move on to this particular section right here, brothers and sisters. And you can look at those notes in your spare time. But now this is Peter. It says there was a Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha. By Gentile interpretation, is Dorcas. Now, this is interesting because her Hebrew name is given and also her Gentile name. And it says, a woman that was full of good works. Now, you know, as well as I do, brothers and sisters, that immediately takes you to the law. Full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. But in those days, it says, she was sick and died. And look where this takes your mind. You're already ahead of me reading it. They washed her and laid her in the upper chamber. She had good works, but she died. And both names are given. The Hebrew Tabitha and the Gentile Dorcas. Because both Jew and Gentile, they're all under sin None can be justified by works. This is all in the context of Romans, that every mouth would be stopped by the, lead, by the deeds of the law. No flesh will be justified in his sight because the law is the manifestation of sin. Unless you're washed, to appear six times, and placed in the upper chamber identifying with the death and resurrection of Christ. The word sick is the same word translated weak relating to the law of Moses. There's no mistaking what this sign represents. Now, for as much as Lydda was nigh into Joppa, the disciples heard that Peter was there. They sent two men, the law and prophets, the two witnesses bearing, that he would not delay to come unto them. So Peter arose and went with them, and they brought him into the upper chamber. And it says, all the widows stood by weeping. Now, you know we can go to Romans chapter 7, where Paul uses the metaphor of the widow as those under the law dead to the old husband, that have got to be married to Christ. So here is a woman with a Hebrew name and a Gentile name who does great works, but is sick, the weakness under the law, and dies, who they wash in place in the upper chamber, and widows are weeping. And look what they do. They show the coverings, the coats and garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Isn't that interesting? There is no self-covering under the law. It's the coats and garments and the alms deeds and the good works that she did. You cannot cover themselves. We learned that from the very beginning of Genesis chapter 3. The fig leaks that they sewed together that they tried to cover their own sin. Remember, 
They send Peter at Joppa. These are the coats and garments that she made that are going to be waxed away. So in death, her Gentile name is used, but her name Tabitha is used when she's resurrected in verse 40. It's dead to the Gentile old man, resurrected to the open of this world. So Peter puts them all forth, and he kneels down and prays, and he turned the body saying, Tabitha. The Jewish name is employed, arise. She opened her eyes, and she saw Peter and sits up. And again, he's an extension of the Lord's work. We will cover that next week, God willing. You have to see Christ in the law and prophets. And he gave her his hand, and you know that's all throughout the Acts. He was in our first sign last week. He extended his right hand. He lifted up the lame man. The same word, lifted up, is resurrected to a newness of life. And then he calls the saints and widows to present her alive. And it was known throughout all of Joppa, and Peter tarries many days with Simon an animal covering man. Someone that has his same name, who doesn't make coats and garments, but animal skins. Isn't that phenomenal? He lifts her up, he raises her to a newness of life, Romans 6. A lie from the death of the law, good works and all these, but she still died, and all the garments and all the coats that she made could still not atone for her. Not like the things in Christ can. And so we find this Bible pattern everywhere, brothers and sisters, of the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And we know that Luke recorded Luke in chronological order. He says that in the opening verses of Luke chapter one, and he records Acts. And you get this system where he sends out first the 12 disciples, then the next chapter he sends out 70 others. And the number 70, by the way, it does represent the Gentiles, but it really represents the seed and the hope of Israel among the Gentiles. Remember, brothers and sisters, it is the Feast of Tabernacles in Zechariah 14, that the Gentiles have to go up to remember. And there are 70 bullocks offered during those period of successive days. So it's Gentiles aligning with the hope of Israel. When Israel comes out of Egypt, it says that there are 70 palm trees, Gentiles, fed by 12 wells of water. When the sons of Jacob, 12 of them, come into Egypt, it says there are 70 souls. So it's not just that they're Gentiles, that the word 70 represents Gentiles. It does represent Gentile nations, but it really represents Gentile nations and how they stand related to Israel. And so we're told Israel, brothers and sisters, would serve Babylon 70 years. Why 70 years? Why? Because under that Babylonian system where Daniel receives the visions, he receives the visions for all the kingdoms and the four successive kingdoms because Babylon reigns over them all. But it's Israel ingested into the Gentiles is really what the number 70 represents. By the way, I also got that from our pioneer brethren. What is the age of David? What is the age of David? 70 years. It's the kingdom of God, and it's Israel subduing the nation of the Gentiles. And over and over and over again, we get this number of 70, representing the Gentiles as they stand related to the Jews. So brothers and sisters, I hope that is one remarkable sign for us all as we see the mystery of the Gentiles now being brought to life in Paul and God willing next week's class in Peter. Thank you very much.